All right, we're ready. Can you hear me? You good? Yeah, we're good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Chris Alamo. And I'm Ben Gasway. Together, we are The Amateur Investors. This podcast is our open source journal of everything we learn about investing and wealth management. We're here to explore the key concepts, market dynamics, and investing strategies that will assist you on the path toward financial independence and financial literacy. Our mission is to build us up from amateurs to experts. All suggestions are our own, and we recommend that you do your own research before taking any investment advice. See you in this week's episode. We hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Amateur Investors, episode 22. Uh, this one is questions from the audience from our social media channels. So thank you for everyone that put in questions. Ben, before we get into the questions, anything new on, on your uh, front or anything you want to add before we get into this? No, Chris. I mean, we're doing a little bit of a holiday special. This is, you know, happy Easter, everyone who, who celebrates it. Um, we just wanted to put together sort of a, a laid back episode. Um, it, it's just nice to have a touch point with the audience and, and to get a chance for folks to ask questions like, we love questions from the audience. That's, that's probably really the main driver for us doing this is, is to interact with folks and to help share what, what we've learned. Um, main highlights. I mean, Chris, that's a really nice sweater. It looks like is that cashmere. It's cashmere. It's nice. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the season. That's the amateur <laughs> investor season. It's the season of cashmere. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Right. Let's kick it off. We'll get right into it. All right. So Ben, investing seems complicated. How do I, if I've never invested before, do, how do I get started? And then there's kind of a sub point to that. How do I invest without using Robinhood? Cause we, and we'll get into that as well. So. Yeah, that was a very, very good follow up from uh, our, our good friend, uh, Nico. Um, so investing is simple to, to execute, but difficult to excel in. Um, I, th I think that the, the first thing that you can start doing with investing is really you can just start with an index fund i feel like that if you want to have exposure um to public markets like the s p 500 um as an index fund is is a really easy way to to at least dip your foot in um or to dip your toe in because i feel like once you have skin in the game there's sort of that that fire under your butt to start learning something and i think beyond just buying an s p 500 index fund i think what the best thing that you can do is position yourself in an environment that promotes learning. And there are really good platforms out there. Um, you know, we're not going to talk about Robin hood because there really aren't any learning materials. It's, it, it does exactly what it says it does. It sort of gamifies investing and it's entirely simple. It's, it's zero commissions, zero trades, but with platforms like SoFi, um, which like really is targeted towards the amateur investor, they have tons of learning materials, research. I feel like um, legacy brokerages like a Charles Schwab or Vanguard or Fidelity, they have so much robust research. Like if you're looking at charting tools or research from analysts, those, those tools I think are, are the best place to go. So, um, or if you're trying to go for a, a more passive strategy, Betterment, Wealthfront, or even Acorns, they all have really good learning materials there to expose you to the basic concepts. And I, I feel like with, with investing, I think people think that they're there's like a, a timeline or, or stepping stones that gets you to your picking individual stocks. You never have to, to do that truly. Like there's how you invest is, is truly up to how far you want to go into the rabbit hole. <laughs> um, and I think that the best thing you can do is invest in a brokerage that you feel comfortable with you. It's easy enough to navigate and it has learning materials. So if, if the goal is to learn, find a brokerage that emphasizes that. And, and some of the resources that I just discussed are, are a good place to start. So um, yeah. that's, those are my two cents. I really recommend that. I, I know for me, uh, I like to start with reading. So like Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins is a book I've recommended before. Uh, I Will Teach You to Be, or uh, yeah, I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. Um, that's another good one as well. Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is kind of the mindset of investing. Uh, the Little Book of Investing, it's this little red book by, I think it's by John Bogle, who also invented uh, the Vanguard, or I think it's yeah. John Bogle. Yeah, John, also wrote that. John Bogle, Bogle. Um, yeah, the, the Little Book of Common Sense Investing, is it? Or the Little Red Book of Investing. Yeah, Legend and then, of Vanguard. And then what's the last one? Oh, Cashflow Quadrants, another one by mm -hmm. Robert Kiyosaki. So he did Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Cashflow Quadrants. So those are kind of the first five books that I'd recommend. If you're not as much of a reader, which I completely understand, there's a lot of good resources on YouTube. 
Uh, I would use them as references though, and not as like, they say buy, you know, Peloton, so you buy that stock or, you know, do your own research. But I definitely think that's a good starting point for learning how, or looking at how various people. And like I said, don't just take one person, look at like five different people. Uh, Meet Kevin does stock analysis. Uh, Jeremy from uh, Financial Education does it. I know Andre Jack. I know uh, Graham Stephan. Those are kind of the four that I go to. Uh, you can even do, uh, what is it, uh, Dave Ramsey, he's more of a conservative investor, doesn't really believe in debt, but he believes in like how to, you know, distribute your wealth. So kind of take, take all the best advice from all these different people and kind of come up with your own research and you get the best results. Yeah, and we're, we're heavily influenced also just by, I guess, Genesis is the investors podcast um, yep. with Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. I, I think they're a really non-pretentious, really informative way to start building a repertoire of knowledge um some of the stuff is more involved but you know like take what you can with that um and what i found most appealing with that group and i think this is applicable as a filter to all resources is look for look for resources that are building your toolbox not building your house like what chris was just saying not not people who are just like throwing out stock names and saying you know this is like buying amazon for three dollars look for look for the the skill set to pick something like Amazon, not the pick itself. That's those are the resources you want to do because it is diff difficult to replicate Amazon. You won't do it likely. <laughs> so, but having the the tools and the knowledge base to to sort of replicate it and look for what made Amazon successful, that will go a lot longer, a lot further than you know just a a stock pick that maybe you throw a thousand bucks in. That's my yeah. my opinion. Yeah, I definitely. Like I said, Jeremy from Financial Education, meet Kevin and Graham Stephan, and even Andre Jack. Those are the four YouTubers that you just look at their videos and how they go about evaluating a stock. I, I know meet Kevin does a lot of really good ones. And those are kind of the ones that I, I go to, to do that. Uh, and then without using Robinhood, I know I use SoFi. I know Ben uses uh, Fidelity or Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab. Uh, I'm also, I also use M1 finance, uh, which is like, I created my own in Chris's index with my buddy just for fun. And then I also, um, you can use like interactive brokers. One thing that you kind of want to avoid is process to order flow. That's what Robin Hood's known for doing, basically selling your trades to someone else. So someone can front run your trades. Um, yeah, so there, like there's some, there's definitely some nuances to that. Like the, yeah. the, the PFOF or whatever process for order flow. It's controversial because I feel like Robin Hood brought it to light, but I feel like it's a pretty common practice. Yeah. I don't know how so against it. does it, do I... it, but I like him a lot more for their resources and, and stuff yeah. like that. And I, I'm not trading in such large quantities that like, if it's a million dollars I'm investing, I wouldn't use SoFi because I wouldn't want someone front running that trade. But for a right. few hundred bucks or thousand dollars that I'm investing a week or, you know, once a month or whatever, that's, they're that's not going to swing the market one way yeah. or another. I think the frequency of trading is the big thing. That's where you need to consider it because like PFOF is a nice, I don't even know if that's, if that's an acronym that you say out like yeah. an acronym, but um, it it's nice because it does enable you to have the commission free and $0 trade fees. So it's like, yeah, they're getting pennies sort of like fractions of pennies on a trade and it feels shady and it, it is, but it's 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 a means to an end to get you to that zero dollar trade fee, which like to not have to pay seven bucks every trade, that's pretty good. So like I think there's a ways to go in terms of just like the the back end sort of like shady fees, but I, I don't think it's always bad. I think it's just like with the the issue with the Robin Hood thing was they didn't have liquidity to cover their trade. So people were getting screwed and they stopped trading. It, it wasn't necessarily the fees. It was the yeah. stopping of the trading, which is not an open and free market. So yeah. um I dig I digress. <laughs> Cool. So Chris, um, I think when people think investing, they already all, all like immediately go to stocks. What, yeah. what, are, what are some things that people can invest in um, just beyond stocks or just really just broadly markets that come to mind? And we can't cover it all, but what are yeah. some things that people can invest in? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you can invest in, in many different things. And I know that's like, oh, Chris, that, that's of course I can invest in a lot of things. I know Warren Buffett always says, and I know we quote him a lot on this show, like the best thing to invest in is yourself. 
So whether that's buying a book, if that's what your learning is, you know, even purchasing a course, some people are like, oh, never purchase courses that are scams. And like, while I agree, you kind of have to like look at the reviews or see the comments or kind of see what they are. But if you're buying like, a, or if you're taking a real estate course to learn about real estate, that's not a bad thing. You're learning how to go about doing it. If you know, if you're paying for a course on investing in stocks, if you're paying for something that you truly want to learn about, that's never a bad investment. Yeah, you don't have to buy their product or whatever they're promoting at the end, but at least if you buy the course and you learn something from it, that's valuable. I love books. I love paying for courses personally. Uh, I've done a real estate course. Uh, I've read a bunch of books, uh, but not even that. You can learn in, uh, you can invest in other things like gold. You can invest in real estate. You can invest in cryptocurrency. We recommend only Bitcoin, but you can do your own research and you can invest in whatever you want. Uh, we obviously invest in stocks. Um, you can invest in your own business. If you want to start your own business, you know, you can start with 50 bucks. I mean, trust me with Ben and I starting this business, uh, very minimal capital up front. We bought a microphone, a webcam, and we paid for a podcasting software. Aside from that, pretty much everything else we try and do as free as possible because yeah. we don't have that much money to, to back us yet. Hopefully one day, but, uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Cool. All right. So uh, ben, is it risky to pick your own stocks? So I know you and I advocate for picking index funds because you're kind of getting this exposure to everything. Uh, but if you want to individually pick stocks, you think that's risky or, or what would be your advice to someone about that? It's as risky as the amount of research that you put into it. Um, there's, I mean, there's always a chance that, I mean, with every company that there's a chance that it goes to zero always. I mean, that's yep. just the downside of owning any, any stock. Any um, asset, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Yeah, even even a bond. Real like estate, a US your treasury. house can crash, you know, yeah. you fall down, you know, gold could be worth nothing. It's the US basically. could default, which is unlikely, but possible. Yeah. Um it, it's not it's not a it's not a zero possibility. So that's that's a good yeah. all assets can go to zero. That's a really good point, Chris. It's it's in the eye of the beholder and end of the market. So um I think I think owning stocks is that's a loaded question. I guess like it, it really depends on, on the strategy that you deploy with, with owning the stocks. Um, I think this is something we'll certainly cover is, you know, diversification. If you're all in on, you know, a penny stock, that's pretty risky <laughs> when compared to owning a basket of, you know, 30, 30 stocks or owning just like the straight up S and P 500 index fund where you, you own 500 companies and the likelihood of them all going to zero becomes much less than than one one company in one point of time. So that that's something that I kind of think about is like the risk is just really about what is the likelihood of this number of companies and the number could be one, it could be a thousand. What is the likelihood of these number these companies failing? I mean that's that's ultimately what you're dealing with is is this company going to succeed or are they going to fail? And if they fail, it's zero. If they succeed, they either you know stay at the same price or it goes up. So um, it can be risky. Um, especially if you don't do your own research, if you're not doing your research, you're gambling. So yeah. yeah, I guess it's really up to you to, to figure out how risky that really is. Um, so I guess, I guess that really ties into, you know, Chris, like what is, what is risk, risk tolerance? That was, that was a good question, um, from the audience. What is risk tolerance and, and how do I decide what is my tolerance, um, yeah. in my investment strategy. Yeah. So, so that's a really good thing. So it, it's kind of different for everyone. I know that's not, it's kind of a answering it with, you know, kind of a nuance, but it really depends on multiple things. It depends on your age. It depends on when you are in retire. It depends on what you want to do with your money. You know, it depends on a lot of things. If, uh, for example, like me, you know, I, I want the flexibility to retire by I'm 40. And that's just kind of a goal of mine. If I don't hit it, if it's 45, it's 50, you know, that's a goal of mine to shoot for 40 that I can be flexible with whatever I do. You know, if I retire, that's awesome. If I don't, I make even more money. That's awesome. So I have to be a little bit more, I guess, aggressive in my investing in the sense that um, like, a 401k is not going to get me at least in a tax advantage way. You know, you got to be 59 and a half before I can take it out without penalty. So even though I do believe in the 401k and my Roth IRA long-term, that's kind of my diversification. I put, I front loaded a bunch of money in that. And now I'm diversifying into real estate, into Bitcoin, into other assets that I see in the next 10 to 15 years that I can start taking cash flow from, whether by, you know, uh, leveraging them but, and, and, you know, uh, basically taking out a loan against those assets, or even if they're cash flowing as in like rental, rental properties that are giving me a positive cash flow every month, um, 
you know, and that's kind of all comes with doing your own research. Like I really believe in Bitcoin. I believe if you own a home and it's paying co positive cash flow, you know, essentially you can do that forever. You know, if it's always positive, obviously, you know, there's black swan events like coronavirus. I'm sure Manhattan real estate, LA real estate, um, various places across the United States are hit harder, much, much harder than, you know, in areas that uh, have a lot more inflow. So the way that I'm trying to do it is, uh, I know I've said on this episode before, I'm trying to buy uh, a primary residence right now in North Carolina and uh, eventually maybe try and diversify in that market of it's kind of an up and coming market. Yeah, it's not as big as New York or LA, but it's not as rural as like middle of the country. So it's kind of a good mix of like, it's up and coming. There's a bunch of young people moving there. Um, and I think it see that as long-term growth. Yeah, it's a risk. Uh, someone could, the market could say, no, this isn't a great area, but it's kind of the way that I'm looking at the market and way I'm looking at real estate and, and investing in general. Um, so. Yeah, that's good. I think you really hit on, you know, risk mitigation and time preference um, from the way that you kind of synthesize that. And, and that really ties into how you invest. And I think even at more of a, maybe a micro scale, to me, if you're looking at risk tolerance on like an individual basis of a, an individual investment, the way that I kind of think about um, risk tolerance for a specific investment is what percentage decline on that position would influence me to sell or panic. Yeah. I feel like when do emotions come in based on the price action of an asset? Um, and I feel like you have to kind of simulate it personally where it's like, okay, if I, own, if I buy this stock, let's say you're going to buy Tesla and it goes down 50% tomorrow, am I selling? If you yeah. did your fundamental analysis and nothing's changed fundamentally about the business and you have you know a, a price target on how you want to own the, the asset, you should probably buy more. Yeah. Um, but that you really have to have sort of like a coming to truth moment about your own investment, your own, your own emotions and your own tendencies. So I feel like you have to think about that is yeah. what, what will it take to influence me emotionally? And I think being aware of your tendencies and automating things and just like being true to your thesis is key. So um, yeah. really great points, Chris. Yeah. Another Warren Buffett quote, be greedy when other people are fearful and fearful when other people are greedy. So when the we'll market crashes, Warren Buffett like <laughs> licks his lips and he's like, I'm about to buy the whole market. So, you know, he definitely always keeps cash on the side and he gets criticized for having too much cash, but you know, he's one of the most successful investors of all time because of the methods to his madness. So a lot of people are saying he's sitting, last time I checked, it was like $112 billion on the side. And everyone's like, inflation, we're printing so much money. Warren Buffett's not stupid. He knows this, but he knows when the market corrects or crashes, he's going to buy up so many companies that, you know, he becomes the lender of last resort. You know, when the Fed can't even back you up or bail you out, Warren Buffett's like, you know, I'm, I'm here to bail you out, but that's the cost of buying your business basically, or, you know, having equity stake in whatever business he buys. So he's, he got to where he is because of it methods to the madness, basically. Very true. Uh, all right. So I hear it's crucial to be diversified. Why is that Ben? Yeah, I think we covered a little bit of this um, in some of the previous questions, but I think focusing specifically on diversification that sort of ties in also to the risk tolerance. Um, when you're owning, you know, a, a, a handful of assets and that's across, it doesn't need to just be stock. I'm saying assets more broadly, whether you're owning commodities, you know, cryptocurrency, stocks, real estate, what have you. If one of those assets goes down in price or up, you're not overexposed in one position. I mean, that, that this is perfect for Easter. You can't have all of your eggs in one basket. It's good to have multiple baskets because if one yep. basket has a hole in it, um, at least you have the other to get you across the finish line. So um, diversification hedges out that risk where you're really just smoothing volatility. Um, and in the long term, that tends to outperform um, just a singular pick because it's hard to be right 100% of the time. Yeah. And I know there was, there was some uh, statistic or uh, saying basically most millionaires by the time they are a millionaire, they have six sources of income. So whether you know they're getting passive income through rental properties, whether they're getting passive income from their business, passive income for things that they sell, passive income through cryptocurrency, passive income through the bond market, passive income through the stock market, through dividend stocks or selling equities. Basically, what your goal is to try and get as many uh, forms of income coming in, whether you sell a book, whether you sell a program, whether you get ads on YouTube, they're always trying to build their, like their diversification is build things that pay you money back. And that's how most millionaires or billionaires get, you know, get to where they are basically. 
Yeah, that's for sure. That's a good one. Um, I think um, when people think about like just being really successful, they, they automatically jump to retirement, which maybe isn't the goal for, for everyone. Not yeah. everyone needs to have that, you know, I just kick back and relax. But if you are going to retire, um, you know, what type of retirement account should you invest with? And, you know, what are some of the benefits to the, to the few that are, that are out there? Uh, oh, so sorry, I blanked out there. Yeah, a few of the retirement uh, accounts that you should have. Uh, I know, so in talking with uh, Jim Kreider, he was on one of our previous ep episodes, I think 18 or 19, I, I forget now. Uh, but one of the ones that he recommended was an HSA, which is a health savings account. I literally think this is better than a Roth 401k and uh, a Roth IRA, you know, or a 403b, whatever you have, in the sense that it's triple leverage, meaning that uh, you can put it in tax-free, it can grow like a Roth IRA tax-free. And then if you uh, make your health payments over the years out of your pocket, instead of using that, when you get to retirement, you can then pay yourself literally tax-free. Like let's just say over the course of my life from now at 28 to 65, when I go to make a withdrawal, I can say, oh, I've paid all these medical bills and they have to be qualified medical expenses, whether it's doctor's appointments, surgeries, you know, anything, medicine, it obviously has to qualify and you have to check your own plan. But in the end, I could say I can take $100,000 out of that account cash free because of all these bills and I'm basically paying myself out of the account without paying zero tap capital gains, zero capital gains, which is awesome. So you get the yeah. benefit of tax free, growth free tax. And, uh, you know, you can withdraw it. I know there's hard caps on it for single and family, uh, single and families. I think it's $3,600 or 7,200 for families, uh, 3,600 for single people. And then, uh, so then after your HSA, so being the most important account, a 401k, uh, we always recommend Roth, but traditional is just as good as well. Uh, do it up to the point where you get the match. So if your company is giving you 3%, 4%, 5%, 7%, whatever it is, Take the free money. If you need to put in 10% to get 7%, if you need to put in 5% to get 4%, whatever it is, whatever their calculation is, get the free money. It's literally free money that you don't have to do anything. The company gives you. Uh, you have to check with your company and your provider. And then the last one, after you max out, out to that, what I prefer to do is put the anything over into my Roth IRA. Uh, so that's money that it's more flexible. Uh, it's, you know, you can take out without penalty of any of the principal you put in. So if I put in $10,000, it grows to $30,000. Yeah, if I wanna take the, the $20,000 of growth, I'd be penalized. But if I ever need to take out that $10,000, uh, read the fine print of, on it. But maybe, First home purchase. Yeah, for home purchase or for first. Even, I think, yeah, only your first, your, first, your first home and even for qualified medical expenses and stuff. But, I believe so. Yeah, the Roth um, IRA has the most flexibilities. It has the like most flexibility. Speaking. And then if you max out your Roth IRA, you max out your HSA, you can go back to your 401k, or you can even go into individual, individual stock picking, which Ben and I do, or you can save money for rental property or cryptocurrency. But that's kind of the breakdown or, you know, the way I figured out HSA first then my 401k to get the match, then Roth IRA. And then I have a separate investing account that I'm putting into Bitcoin and into real rental property. And so it's just kind of the cycle or the game of investing, basically. I know that's a long-winded answer, but- I No, it's good stuff. It. And just a disclaimer, it's, it's, I know what you meant by triple leveraged, as it, it's triple advantaged. It's triple not like, advantage, it's not, not, a leverage, it's not, not like yeah. a margin. It's not like a triple levered put. You're, yeah. It's just cash. <laughs> triple tax advantage. Advantaged, bingo. Go. That can be on our next t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how can I, how can investing uh, affect my taxes, Ben? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a really prudent one given, given the tax season. Um, I, I feel like I don't want to go too in depth because we could probably have a full episode just on taxes, but um, the, the two main things to, to be aware of are your short-term and your long-term capital gains. Yep. So if you hold an asset for less than a year in one day, you're going to be put into the short-term tax bracket. And what that is, it's, it's, it's based on your federal tax income, your federal income tax. So that could be, it could be zero, it could be high, depending on, you know, your given income for a specific tax year. And the long-term capital gains, that could be zero, 15 or 20, uh, depending on your income bracket. Um, but once you hold an asset for um, a year and one day, you drop into the, the, long-term capital gains, which honestly, if you're going to average it out, you're probably saving 10%. So you, you realize an immediate 10% just by holding the asset. That's why, you know, Warren Buffett really does advocate for holding a stock forever. Um, so be aware of your tax lots and how you sell and trade. Um, you can kind of model it out online, but that's something to be really aware of is 
you know, intraday trading can really add up the tax bill at the end of the year. Yep. Cool. Um, so Chris, I, you know, going back to some of the retirement planning, when and how should you prioritize retirement over non-retirement investing? Yeah. I think you covered it really well, yeah. but like maybe home, bring it home a little yeah, bit more. Definitely. Uh, so anything that involves free money from your company, from whatever it is uh, going into your, uh, into your tax accounts, that's what I really recommend doing first. That's why I love HSAs. And that's why I love 401ks for, for the match from your company. Uh, and then non-retirement, I mean, a lot of people, you can break away earlier from that. So I do HSA, raw, uh, 401k, and then um, IRA money. And, and then I have investing account. Some people just do one of them. Some people do none of them. Uh, but that's the way that I like doing it. And then doing non-investments, I have money for Bitcoin. I have money for real estate. I have money for anything else, that kind of a separate account. That So I'm trying to build them equally. Some people say, I don't want to do retirement. I want money now to do stuff. Some people say, I only do retirement. And that's what I focus on. I like to diversify even my investing strategy and do a little bit of both. Um, okay. Uh, oh, we can cover it. Yeah. Uh, I have a retirement account. I want to start investing towards another goal. How do you go about this? Uh, what's your opinion on that, Ben? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing to do is that I, a lot of people and including myself, we'll just assign arbitrary targets on retirement ac account savings where it's like, I'm going to max out my 401k or I'm going to put, you know, 30% of my money into the retirement account without really thinking about what, you know, income you need at retirement. Um, you know, if you're, if you're feeling pretty comfortable with your lifestyle as it is today, then what you should do is model out how much you're saving now and then model how much you'll have at a retirement. There are so many calculators and tools on, mm -hmm. on like the disbursement of retirement accounts. Model out how much you'll have like the projection at retirement, um, given like your current balance and your current contributions. Play with some of the percentages. And, you know, if you're investing, you know, 30% in your 401k, but you only need, you know, 50k or 70k or even, you know, more or less, depending on whatever your needs are, adjust it to get what you need in retirement. Because the retirement accounts, if all else works out amazingly and you know, you, you're in a good place financially, the retirement account should be a backup plan. You know, if, if you're healthy, you, you can kind of live off of the assets that you built. Let's say you own real estate or you own a business, uh, a passive business, um, if possible. Um, the retirement account is a backup plan. So model out what, what you actually need, not just to have the biggest number possible, because like Chris was even saying, like at 59 and a half, um, I mean, you hopefully have another 50 years to live and, you know, in the years between that, you know, let's say you start working at age 25, so you got another, what, 34 years, um, 34 and a half years of life to live. Like don't, don't short sell yourself throughout that time. Like make sure you have some of those sem liquid to semi-liquid investments. So if you want to buy a house, the retirement account's not going to do that. If you yeah. want to buy a nice car, the retirement account is still not going to do that. Um, and if you want to buy, you know, a ring for wedding, have investment accounts based on, we're talking about risk tolerance and sort of volatility, have accounts set up by goal targets and liquidity in intermediately. So understand how much you need a retirement and then backtrack from there and fill the gaps. So that's my advice. Yeah. And I know even I'll just add in one little thing. I know in our mistakes episode, I think I mentioned this on that one. It was episode seven, five or seven, five, six, like seven, seven. It's seven. Um, Maybe it was five. I think it might've been five. I don't, I don't know. Whatever. One of our earlier episodes, I know one of the mistakes that I, I did was I was front running my retirement so much. Like I was hindering the life that I could live by like, I need to put all this money into retirement accounts. And you know, that's cool that I get an awesome base my first one to two years, but my parents kind of had to be like, Chris, like you're, you're doing great. We like, we love you. You're paying all your bills. You're doing this, but you don't need to torture yourself now in order to save for retirement. So then that's when I kind of like, you know, drop some of the numbers and, you know, change jobs. And that also helped by increasing my salary. But, you know, basically you don't have to, hurt, harm yourself or, you know, disadvantage yourself now. Like you can enjoy life. You can go out to bars, you can go out to restaurants with the surplus money that you have after taking care of retirement savings, but you don't have to bootstrap yourself or hinder your, your life now with that. Basically. I, I hope that makes sense. It uh, does. Yeah. Pay yourself first. Yeah. Cool. So Chris, with, with all the accounts, I mean, we, I feel like you and I just have so many accounts and maybe that's a problem, but yeah. Um, <laughs> With your portfolio being, you know, I, it, it, portfolio is like a, is a large, a big word <laughs> for what my investments are, but 
for your investment accounts, how often should you be checking your portfolio? Yeah. So if you're a more lax investor, I'd say when you're first setting up your accounts, you should check them at least for your first couple of paychecks. So if, if you have automated things That's of checking, smart, yeah. I'd say in the very beginning, you should check it at least three to four to five times to make sure that all your investments are going in properly. And I do this even for myself when I set up a new account. Uh, I think Ben and I are the exception rule that I'm constantly checking the market, constantly, you know, doing that. That's just the nature of what we do. But even I know for my 401k, what, now that it's set up, I check it maybe once every six months, once a year is probably yeah, don't check closer it very what often. I do. I don't check it very often at all. I know it's working. I know it's running behind the scenes. Uh, I automate my Bitcoin purchases now. I check that a little bit more regularly because of the volatility of Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, I also have a SoFi investing account and a Roth IRA. I just set up the Roth IRA. So I check that a little bit more frequently because I just set it up. Uh, my SoFi investing, that's kind of more my fun money. If that went to zero, uh, I'd be annoyed. I'd be pissed. But, you know, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Uh, I'd be definitely disgruntled and annoyed. Uh, but that's something I check more regularly because it's just kind of fun money. And, and money that, like I said, if it went to zero, I'd be pissed, definitely. But, you know, I won't, I won't not be able to pay my bills. I won't be able to not pay my debts or my loans for my car or my schooling or, you know, soon-to-be house and stuff. So, you know, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. You need money to live. Uh, you need money for expenses or, you know, going to out to restaurants or whatever it may be. But, um, yeah, so... No, it's perfect, Chris. Uh, so I guess, Ben, the age-old question, when should I sell? Why should I sell and when should I sell? That's a good, that's a really good question. I think that's like the hardest question to answer. And it, it varies by the pick. So I feel like if you're talking about stocks, if something fundamentally changes in the business, and I think we've talked about this in pre previous episodes, something that I do is I have like a, a hit list of three things that for the, the stock that I'm about to invest in, if those three things come to fruition, or even, you know, one or two that if they're sort of diabolical things that happen to the company, if those things come to fruition, I'll sell because the fundamental business has changed. Um, I think another reason to sell is if you have, if you're no longer comfortable with the value valuation um, and, you know, you want to take some profits. I feel like if you, if you don't want to sell your whole position, that's fine. But I think trimming a little off the top is never too bad. So if, if it's gone beyond your valuation thesis or the fundamental business has changed, that's when I'm selling. Yeah. Uh, there's also some strategies, and I know this is not normally what I do. Uh, Warren Buffett always says our holding period is forever. Uh, so I think that's, that's not kinda, true, though. He sells. That's not true. He does, he does sell, but you know, his favorite holding period is forever, I guess. Let's go with that. Uh, but a lot of times I've heard investors do this. So let's just say you invest in something. Use a simple example. You invest in a stock at $5. It goes up to 10 So it's kind of an extreme example. It, it doubled in money. There are some investors that will literally take their initial investment out of the table or off the table with whatever the margin of taxes is as well. So, you know, let's just say they take out $6 to cover the taxes of capital gains or whatever it may be. And then they let that $4 equivalent of stock just ride forever because they're basically playing in theory with house money because they took their initial investment out. They can use that in whatever investment they want to do going forward. So obviously they'll pay the taxes and then they have their original investment of $5 a surplus. So, you know, this is just rough numbers. $5 goes up to $10. They take $6 off the, the table. They give $1 to taxes. This is just, like I said, if it's 10% yeah. is your tax bracket or whatever it may be, they have their original $5. They let the $4 in the stock still ride. And then they use that $5 to do a different investment. A lot of people do that in real estate too. You know, you invest in a property, you start renting it out. Once you get up to the proper equity evaluation, which is normally 20%, they take out their original investment and then buy another property with the money they have. I That's will smart. say that, that, that for real estate, it's a little bit different because it's, it's called leverage. I know I misused that term earlier in the episode, but a lot of times you're basically using debt to, to um, do a purchase. So you know, in the event that the economy for housing goes bad, you still have to owe those payments. And if renters are not renting your properties, you can run into a problem. So that's why they always say location, location, location. Uh, you always want an area where people want to live, even in the event of, you know, a black swan, you know, coronavirus pandemic, maybe Manhattan real estate isn't so good right now, but you know, a Charlotte, North Carolina, um, a Minneapolis, Minnesota might be good. Uh, Denver, Colorado might be good. You have to do your own research and you have to do your own evaluations, but that's just a, a good example of, of places to potentially buy real estate, like I said. No, good stuff and great answers. Um, and even even better, great questions from the audience. So yeah. guys, th thanks for watching and thanks for listening. This was a fun episode. Thanks everyone for the questions. Uh, remember to smash the like button on YouTube and uh, you know follow us on Twitter, Instagram, 
TikTok, uh, you know, all of our platforms. You name it, we're on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can always check out us out on our website. You can even send in questions through there. Um, yeah, it's been real. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye.